Warren McDonald back with you again with the Solution Revolution. This time uh, we're in kind of another pretty cool uh, location. I'm kind of attempting to, to pilot the Steve Irwin here of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society and joining me is James Brook. Hey James. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Great to, uh, to be on board and uh, to kind of share a little bit of of what the Sea Shepherd does and a little bit of your story and how you come to be involved and uh, with people out there and maybe get them fired up to take some kind of action in whatever it is that they want to do. But I wanted to start out in asking you, because a, a big part of what I'm trying to get people to do here is to, uh, is to do something, because a lot of times what I find people hit this wall, they think they want to do something, but they, they hit some kind of obstacle and then they kind of back off and say, oh, well, I'll just go back to whatever it is mm. that I was doing. So, for starters, how did you, how did you get involved? In well, um, I guess like um, I grew up in Victoria in Australia and um, I took a, used to go out in the forest a lot. We've got a lot of old growth forest here and we've got a, a lot less of that left now. And um, in my younger days, I used to um, take part in a lot of anti-logging campaigns in the forest to protect the old growth forest so it became very obvious to me from an early age that the environment's in really big trouble mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's really shocking to think back that was 20 years ago and we thought there was hardly anything left now and still there's lots of logging going on but mm -hmm. um, also I used to work on fishing boats for a short time, I did about six months in um, Bass Strait on scallop boats and um, I just started to see the amount of destruction that was going on in that industry to the seabed and also um, that fishing industry was just dying out, like all the, the fishermen there who had been making a lot of money previously were just going out of business and mm -hmm. it was because they had put themselves out of business with that industry. Um, and also I, uh, you know, I, I worked as a dive master as well so I, I got really involved with the ocean and you know, just sort of seeing what's underwater and um, just realising how it's not only what we can see on land that's being destroyed and is in crisis, but also the ocean. So um, I was working in an operating theatre in, in hospitals as a theatre technician. I had a very comfortable job, but I knew about Sea Shepherd. I'd visited the ships on tours, and um, I just thought I could stay in this comfy job forever, but, um, you know, really something should be done. And um, I could see this organisation as a fairly professionally run organisation, which is... It's not just a bunch of hippies, you know, just sitting around playing guitars or something. You know, we run it very efficiently and professionally. So um, I thought, you know, I'd, I want to take part in that and um, take the activism I've done in the past to a much more serious level. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's why I joined. Right. So it didn't, yeah, so you didn't just kind of wake up, uh, come jump out of bed one morning and, you know, as a regular guy and, and want to step up to be involved in Sea Shepherd that it happened in in steps yeah yeah basically so there's so there was a so there's a huge desire there to make a difference for one but as you said you could have easily stayed in a in a comfy job though yeah it was a hard decision because you know I had a permanent position in the uh, public service and a job that I really loved but um you know I, in some ways I felt too comfortable and just you know on the weekends I'll be out diving and all that sort of thing and I was just very aware that out there, out of my world, was the planet and, you know, we're in a really serious crisis for the whole planet and the humanity that lives on it. I mean, species are going extinct at an unprecedented rate at the moment. Like, right now, humans are causing mass extinction all across the planet and when those creatures are gone, they'll never come back. And, um, yeah, I just thought, you know, now really is the time to do something and, you know... I might have a comfy job now, but in 30, 40, 50 years' time, that's going to be gone. And so, yeah. you know, and Sea Shepherd's a good avenue to move into. You know, it wasn't just like I was out of my own, you know, I can join an organisation that's already got systems in place and slot into that and just add to that and make it stronger. So, yeah, that was the motivation. So I would guess that you'd never go back? Well, I don't know. Right now, I've, I mean, in Sea Shepherd, we're volunteer based and, um, People work very hard, so on this ship we've been at sea doing campaigns for about two years solidly, and then when we're not doing that we're in port, just working. Um, so when we're on campaign people might get a day off a month, mm. and in port maybe a day off a week. So you know, I've been doing that for about three and a half years now, so I'm going to have a big break this year yeah. for about six months. 
But um, you know, I'd, I'd always have the other options of returning to yeah. other work for a while. But um, yeah, definitely what we're doing with Sea Shepherd's very rewarding. And um, yeah, yeah I, I suppose I what I meant was yeah, not so much that you wouldn't uh, that you wouldn't go back. That yeah, you wouldn't look that you wouldn't look back. Oh yeah, well um, that's for sure. Because the more that I've been with Sea Shepherd, the more I've learned about the world's oceans. I mean, you know, we we meet with high-level international scientists and a lot of people involved in marine conservation work and you know I've, I've found that uh, all the CO2 we pump in the atmosphere the ocean absorbs mm -hmm. that it turns the ocean acidic and um, yeah. you know pretty much the coral reefs are going to be gone within a decade um, you know the, the ocean gives us half the oxygen we breathe and um, people don't most people don't really realize that so you know once the ocean stops producing oxygen then life as we know it on the planet mm -hmm. is over and that process is really happening some scientists feel it's irreversible so yeah. you know we're in people might sort of see forests going down or droughts and that sort of thing on the on the land but what's going on in the ocean most people aren't really aware of and it's um it's just extremely serious for you know this era of life on the planet so mm. ocean conservation is um fundamental to trying to protect this sort of life that we have now on the planet and you know, species are going extinct so fast, you know, like within decade, like dec a decade ago, there was so many more sharks, for example, left alive. Now they're being killed for their fins. And, um, you know, they're an apex predator. Once they're gone, you know, it just destabilizes the whole marine ecosystem. Yeah. And I think, yeah, well, that's a key, key point to get across that that we are in massive crisis, and I think most people are in denial about that. But one of the things that I wanted to do with, with Solution Revolution, and it's, and it's called that for a reason, one is that we want to be solution focused, as you said, mm. that one of your roles is, is to actually police the oceans, not just protest and say, hey, you know, stop doing that, but actually doing something about it. But then the revolution part is, I think what's, what's happened and, and what we're reaching a, a critical point in time is people have kind of waited uh, for it to, to be okay to support the Sea Shepherd, hey? Because I remember back in the old days mm -hmm. where, where Sea Shepherd was like this completely radical uh, out there left the field where it was okay to support Greenpeace because, you mm. know, they did things the right way whereas you guys were out sinking ships and all the rest of it. But I think people have to realise that the time for waiting for, for, for mass, mass consciousness, if you like, to say that it's okay and we should stop, it, it'll be too late. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is one of the sort of Sea Shepherd uh, philosophies. I mean, a lot of countries have said, for example, that whaling is illegal. Let's acknowledge that commercial whaling is illegal. But um, there's still big whaling operations going on around the world. And for one thing, people don't realise that they're happening. And also, uh, governments might try to do something through bureaucracy. I mean, the Australian government now has taken Japan to international court about uh, the illegal whaling that Japan does in the Antarctic whale sanctuary, but these processes take forever. I mean, um, commercial whaling was banned in 1986 and it's still going on. Mm. So, you know, in Sea Shepherd, we just don't think there's any point in talking about stuff. You know, we feel like action is what really counts, and you know, we don't have the luxury to wait around for some core case that's going to go on for 10 years. You know, we've got to do something right now because, as I say, there's just you know, huge, huge amounts of species are just going extinct right now in the ocean. And um, even if there's 50 of a particular type of dolphin left and it's not actually categorised as extinct, I mean, that no, it won't recover from that. Like the cod in um, Canada, you know, th those fisheries are not going to recover. They've had it. So, um, you know, people love to talk because while they're talking, they can still carry on with, uh, you know commercial industries or whatever that are just causing them destruction so you know we feel like we have to act now and that's um that's what we do yeah um and we operate and you know all over the world it's not just whaling that we're dealing with you know we have an office in galapagos islands which is a marine national park in ecuador and um, there's a lot of illegal uh fishing going on there um the park rangers we assist them um in lots of ways we work with the local law enforcement there to try to protect their fisheries but um you know, it's, it's very difficult. Um, we're only a small organisation. Um, you know, we have a presence at Taji in Japan where they do, uh, they kill a lot of dolphins there. Mm. Um, and, you know, we operate in places like uh, in Africa 
and um, the Faroe Islands and the Mediterranean. Uh, the Mediterranean is a good example of what's going on because um, the Atlantic bluefin tuna is pretty much on the verge of extinction and um, lots of international scientists fully acknowledge that, uh, European scientists as well, and they say they should pretty much stop fishing it because you know, they're, they're just taking juveniles now. Right. And that's, you know, only in the past decade has it got this serious, but still there's so many countries involved in the Mediterranean, none of them will agree to a, a realistic quota, and so they're all still scrambling to um, get the last of the bluefin tuna. And right. that's a scary thing because extinction is now actually an industry. They, they've realised that they stockpile the tuna, which they're doing, they stockpile yeah. them in freezer warehouses. Once it becomes extinct, it will be so much more valuable. Interesting. So that's a really frightening thing that's happening in our era as well. Yeah, well, it's kind of sick. The, <laughs> the, the really interesting thing for me and that I want to get across to people because I know uh, a lot of people have a problem with radical action. Like I said, they, kind of, they need to wait for it to be sanctioned. Hmm. But I think some, one of the reasons that, that the Sea Shepherd has kind of gained uh, the popular culture's attention is I, I think people recognise integrity and, uh, and, and people operating within ethics and, mm. and, and, and honour. And I think that alone has, a, has people have, have slowly seen that and recognised that in the work that you guys do and it's, and it's allowed you to kind of step up in people's minds and, and be okay. Be nice if it had have uh, kicked into action 35 years ago, but yeah, as you say, these things take time. But something else that that, that I want to get across to people is the. You know, I'm losing my train. Lost lost my train of thought. This idea of every we people are in business and we have to make money and 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 all the rest of it, but. We need to really pay close attention when somebody is, is, is acting and putting themselves on the line for no financial gain. So the people that, that you're in conflict with have uh, huge gains to be made, or there are huge gains to be made financially. Mm. Whereas you guys are basically see a wrong and you're out to right it. And I think something that I hope to see as we move forward that we really pay attention because I know from my time in the forest we had nothing to gain financially, and people thought we were just nut jobs. And, mm and all the rest of it. And now, over time, 20 years later, we'll prove to be right. You know, we, we know that, we, uh, that we've that we overlogged and all the rest of it. And I think people just need to get it that you guys aren't there for, out there for no reason because you just want to play skellywag and mm. it's kind of way beyond that. Yeah, I mean, as I say, it is a, it's just such a serious time for um, the environment on the planet at the moment. And um, as you're saying as well, um, we... The, you know, there's sort of a, a more natural law, and that, that's perhaps why we get a lot of support, as you're saying. You know, people realise that what we're doing is, um, you know, the whalers, for example, in, in Antarctica, they, they say that they're, they're doing research. You know, that's their excuse. Mm. But um, everybody knows that that's just a loophole, and that's just, you know, a way they found their way through the law to be able to justify it to themselves. But even though in the whaler's eyes what they're doing is legal, I think people realise that we have the moral high ground, mm. the Sea Shepherd. But also I would add that um, everything we do, we always have a law on our side, so we use a lot of international environmental laws um, to justify the actions we do. And um, also we're very careful not to hurt anybody, so yeah. you know, we, we, don't, we don't have a problem doing property damage, but um, you know, if that's going to help be effective and, and stop um, some sort of illegal fishing that's going to be putting a species extinct. But, um, yeah, we're never going to hurt anybody, and we've had a very good um, record in 35 years. We haven't done that. Um, recently, a few months ago, the, um, the, the Japanese whalers took us to court in America and um, tried to say that we were endangering the lives of their crews and all that sort of thing, and it was basically thrown out of court because um, the judge said, OK, you know, this has been going on for about a decade. Show us the record of some injuries that have occurred in this time and they, they had no they couldn't show anything. So um you know I think that ethic has worked for us and it's one reason why we have a lot of support because yeah. you know initially people know Sea Shepherd ram ships, they sink ships, all this dangerous stuff. But then when they look close and we say, well we've never hurt anybody, you know, the ships that we're sinking, that's done because they're you know, they're 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 hunting elite you know, endangered species and that sort of thing. 
Mm-hmm. Um, then people can sort of weigh it up. I, I guess what we do is a bit like um, if someone was robbing a bank, for example, and um, you went and slashed the tyres in their getaway car, you know. Yeah. At first, if you saw someone slashing the tyres, you might think, hey, you know, they're, what are they doing to that right. car? But then if, in the bigger picture, you realise that car's being used for an illegal act, then, um, yeah. you know, it's justified, so, yeah. What's been the most rewarding part for you? Um, well, certainly um, being able to go to some pretty isolated places in the world and um, see some creatures that, you know, I, I didn't even know existed. Right. And that's probably one thing for um, a lot of people in normal everyday life. There is still a lot of amazing wild creatures out there that mm. people don't even know they exist. Like, for example, um, one time we were being chased by um, the Japanese security ship and to get away from them we went into French territory in Kerguelen Island, which is a sub-Antarctic island. And um, once we were in that territory, the, the, the whaling ship couldn't follow us in. But um, we were surrounded by common sense dolphins as we came into Kerguelen Island. And these are black and white dolphins. They look like panda bears, you know, they've got that sort of colour pattern. And, you know, I never even knew such a thing existed. But, um, you know, to be able to see those creatures in a fairly untouched environment was like, um, yeah, just amazing. So it's a very rewarding experience, that's for sure. Yeah. And um, another time, um, we were in the Faroe Islands last year where we had a campaign to um, stop the Faroese driving pilot whales onto the beaches and slaughtering them as they do regularly throughout the year. And um, we were trying to herd a, a, a pod of pilot whales away from the Faroes and um, I was with, with um, some of the divers who were swimming with the pilot whales and that's just an amazing experience. You, know, you realise how humans, you know, we're just such a... Uh, weak kind of creature really you know we're just floundering around in the water and these huge creatures the pilot whales just completely in their element you know they're swimming right up to us and you're, you're worried they're going to hit you but they know exactly where you are and what you're doing and just to be seeing them you know and to be part you know be amongst them you could really sense that they're a family they're intelligent creatures they're communicating they're conscious and um yeah it just gives you a different perspective and later on that campaign as well, we um, were diving under the cliffs where the Faroese dump the bodies. And um, it was like a boneyard underwater, just piled up with the skeletons and the skulls of the pilot whales. And so from having done that, swum with the pilot whales and then see where they end up, it, you know, it was, it was quite a, you know, it's yeah, it a really moving experience to realise that, you know, they're intelligent and they communicate and then see where they end up once they get slaughtered for no good reason as well. Mm pretty confronting yeah yeah well we might uh, we might wrap that for there but I didn't I'd encourage everybody to uh, to get to jump on the website and just if there's any if you want to support the work that James and his crew do financially or in in, in any way but it's cshepherd.org yeah www.cshepherd.org yeah yeah but just, I want to say personally, just uh, yeah, thanks for what you what you do and keep up the right. good work. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. You can answer this uh, any way you, you like, but basically, my question is, what do you think it will take for humans to be on another track? Well, I think uh, you know people really have to uh, have a massive sort of consciousness change in the planet and um, you know, just look out of their normal everyday lives and you know, start to realise that you know, the reason we can breathe is cause of, because of the, the uh, environment you know, and we've really got to protect that. If we don't protect that then you know, all our fancy cars and everything it's going to be for nothing because the way we're going the environment is certainly going to collapse possibly within our lifetime so you know, people really have to realise it's, you know, us with Sea Shepherd doing what we're doing, it's good. We can be effective in the small areas we operate in, but it's not going to be enough to um, to stop the massive amount of species extinction that's happening, and it's not going to be enough to um, stop the climate change that's going on. So it's, you know, the thing I've found is that individuals really can make a difference, and, um, you know, you might think just one person just doing something and contacting another ten people isn't that going to be that effective, but it really is. So the more people that, you know, start taking some sort of action, and you've really got to do something, 
you know, whether it's growing veggies in your backyard or whatever, you know, the more people that start really getting involved and taking responsibility themselves, then, then we've got a chance to turn this massive crisis around that we're facing this century. Yeah. And you, yeah, I think you hit on something really important there is all of us have the power to, to do that because I think that's, in some ways that's part of the problem is people have this sense of that, um, that there's not much that they can personally do. Mm, completely. But I think, as you said, all action, any, any action is a good start. Start somewhere, do something. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, most people have a bit of free time during the week. You know, if, if people just spent one evening a week you know, doing, taking some sort of action to, yeah. you know, help the planet or, you know, in whatever way they can think of, then that's worthwhile and it can even really affect change. Even if they miss an episode of Whale, uh, Wars One Week, I mean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah switch the TV off and yeah. get out there. Yeah.